Welcome, everybody. My name is Mike Imhenna. I'm the executive director of Afikra. I'm very, very honored to be joined by my co-moderator today, Yusuf Sharif, who is calling in from uh, Tunis today. Um, this event is a special edition of our Afikra conversation series because we're doing it in partnership with the Columbia Global Center in Tunis, which is a, a huge privilege for us. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Mikey, and uh, hi, everyone. I think this is one of the first maybe Zoom meetings that I'm attending, and I'm happy to attend because it, it's not, you know, I don't feel the weight of, um, of these <laughs> Zoom meetings that I have to attend from a specific time to a specific time, and that uh, I need to be very careful about what I say, etc. So thank you for um, this great event and this great initiative. Um, so I run the Columbia Global Centers Tunis. I have with me here Sirene Amami, who is the program officer at the Columbia Tunis. We've been working on the Columbia Tunis for a few years now, and now it's full center. So you can visit our website that you see here. Um, basically, what we do is to represent Columbia University in this part of the world, uh, here meaning um, Tunisia, but also North and West Africa. So we have a few programs here and there. Um, but uh, this year, something very important that we're doing at Columbia University, and that's why when you open the website, you see this university initiative for international students. We're open to our students who weren't able to make it to New York. So we are a kind of um, delocalized classroom of Columbia University in our parts of the world. Uh, so the nine global centers are doing this, we're nine. Um, and uh, we also have um, pop-up spaces in several area regions in, in the world. Um, but apart from hosting Columbia students and organizing um, trainings and other projects for, uh, so we work a lot with ministries of higher education and the, of education in uh, the region. Uh, we also organize events, um, sometimes by ourselves, sometimes with partners and um, uh, this time, so we're with uh, Afikra. Um, so you're also very welcome to follow us and um, uh, maybe your first priority would be to follow Africa and your second priority is to follow Colombia Tunis. Uh, you have the Twitter handle here, CGC Tunis, but also on Facebook um, and uh, we always look forward to um, be open and to welcome you all now on Zoom, but hopefully soon in Tunis. Um, and from here, I think I'll, uh, because obviously you're not here to hear about us, but to hear uh, to hear Tawfiq, so um, I would like to introduce um, our dear uh, doctor, as we call him, uh, Tawfiq Ben Amor, uh, the Gordon Gray Jr. Senior Lecturer in Arabic Studies at Columbia University, and also the director of the Columbia Arabic Summer Program in Amman and Tunis. Um, Tawfiq is also, by the way, um, a member of the Faculty Advisory Committee for the Tunis Global Center. Uh, he's been very supportive uh, since the center's foundation, actually. Um, Tawfiq, of course, studied in Tunis uh, and in the University of Tunis, where he got his doctorate, and he specializes in Arabic language and linguistics. Um, at Columbia, he teaches um, language and linguistics, uh, but also he studies a lot uh, Sufism and also music and Arabic music. And I think this, is, this will be an important part of, the, um, of what Tawfiq will be talking about today. Um, you saw his picture with the Oud, but also Tawfiq plays the Oud very well. Uh, but maybe more importantly, he knows about the Oud and he knows about Arabic music more than, I guess, any one of us in this room today. Uh, so Tawfiq, welcome and thank you very much for accepting to be with us. And the, for, the floor is yours, but be, before the floor becomes yours, I wanted to ask you, what pushed you to be this old lover and this lover of Arabic music? Mm, great question. But first of all, I mean, thank you, Mikey. Thank you, Yusuf. This is amazing uh, work that you're doing, you know, having these opportunities to have. Thank you. you know, such a wonderful and informal space in which, you know, I, I feel honored, you know, to talk about my work and my interests and mm. all of these things. I mean, I the music in in the Arab region is all around us, you know, basically. And uh, you know, my father, you know, was a drummer and a singer, which I think it played an important role in my love for music, you know, from the start. But I I think you, you all know it's like music is in the kitchen, it's in the cab, yeah, it's in the street, it's everywhere. People, I mean, you can hear people late at night 
you try to sleep and somebody's walking the alleyway singing, <laughs> you know, a song by Buthum or Fahid al it's it's part of the soundscape, you know, of, of, of my childhood, but also I've seen it practiced, you know, in so many different events. I used to live in a, a small alleyway in old Tunis, and at the end of the alleyway, there was a, a, a shop uh, of, of Am Mehrez, you know, who actually was part of a Sufi, uh, you know, brotherhood, and who also uh, sold instruments. And it's almost like daily, you know, he has these people come and sit and play music. You know, not to mention also the other events that we go to when music is everywhere. But basically that was almost like a daily thing where I could see them play. So I was lucky in that sense. I remember neighbors on Thursday evening after dinner just bringing in the frame drums and sitting and starting to sing. It used to be like a quite quite a... You, you don't have to look far, you know, for you to, to hear music all around you. So let, let me ask you a question. Um, you know, it's so interesting when I was going into your work and trying to get a sense of the many things I wanted to talk to you about, there's these two pillars of your work. Um, mm -hmm. There is your work that centers around linguistics and grammar and the Arabic language. And then there's um, all of your work that centers around music. Um, it sounds like music was your first love. How did you, how did you get interested in, you know, how Arabic is taught. Mm. How, did, how did that happen? It, th that's a great question. The love was basically for poetry. I, th yeah. I think that's really the bridge in between the two worlds that I like. It's poetry that, that actually took me into both places. You know, rhythmically, it's, it's, it's just fascinating and very interesting. You know, and on the other hand, there's the music part. And and it's true, like, it, I mean, most of the Arab tradition musically, the, the word is important. I mean, up to a certain point, you know, music was there to serve the, the word, really. You know, so people do listen to poetry. I mean, they do react yeah. to it. And I have a, a an interesting anecdote that I thought of actually a few days ago. I was talking, uh, you know, to, to my wife. And I basically brought it up. I said... As one time I went to talk about the relationship of poetry to, to music, so I gave this, this talk, and then we demonstrated with music. And I was talking about al-muashah, especially, this Andalusian you know, form of music. And I was trying to show how the rhythm in poetry could translate very easily into rhythm patterns and also into melodies. You know, and after I finished the talk, you know, people came and thank you very much. That was like really great. I loved that song. That song was better than the other, etc. And then I had this, you know, older Lebanese guy who was sitting in the back who came to me and he says, that's a beautiful enunciation of poetry. What beautiful enunciation. This is basically his comment. And it, enunciation? It, 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 how I recited the poetry and how I wow. pronounced the poetry. Wow. So he was actually amazed about with the pronunciation and, and also with the ilqa, you know, this way of reciting poetry. That was his comment. Hmm. I mean, it wasn't about the instruments. It wasn't about the music that we had played or any of the poets that I mentioned. It was really about this very important part, you know, which is which is the 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 word, and so this is this is sort of you know music went on through my life as an informal thing. You know, the only time that I went to to school was to go into a uh, Rashidiya, which is this um, you know uh, school in in Tunis that teaches the Andalusian you know, part. That was basically the only formal, all, all the other training has been with individuals, with, you know, teachers, yeah. with masters, you know, who taught me specific things and different things, etc. And then there was my academic trajectory, which was all about linguistics and Arabic and poetry and language and all of that. And I think after I graduated, after I got my, my doctorate, it was 
time for fun, you know, time yeah. to actually bring my loves together and make it sort of my area of research. There's, uh, frankly, there's there are very few people who work on 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 lyrics of songs. You know, there are very few people who are actually paying attention to that part. So I felt that, you know, what what's best than sitting there, you know, listening to songs and kind of transcribing them and, you know, and, and actually doing your research about that and while understanding also the music part, you know, of it. So, yeah, I think, um, Yusuf, do you have a question? I have a, I have a follow up. Is that OK? Uh, so so for me, when I think about lyrics, uh, mm -hmm. the, the nature of lyrics and the nature of poetry tends to actually, um, my understanding, tends to afford, um, uh, you know, flexibility around grammar. You know, lyricists tend to be really liberal with grammar, you know, like because mm -hmm. they're, 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 there's art. Um, and so this idea that um, a, a lot of the work that, that I saw of yours focused on this idea that why are we letting, why are we letting grammar, uh, why are we not teaching grammar properly? Yeah. Why, why do so many speakers not understand Arabic grammar properly? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so is, is our, you know, is Arabic poetry and the lyrics in these songs great representations of, of Arabic grammar at its sort of peak? Or is it also sort of liberal and flexible and art? No, it the is. Way it is if, we, if we're talking about right fusha, you know, if we're talking yeah. about the standard and then we're talking about fusha, yes, grammar is is essential. And and there's something about Arabic also that I, I think works with at least the the poetry, the way the tradition, you know, has set it up. It, it's mm -hmm. word order, you know, because in in, in fusha you can mark the ends of words to say this is subject, this is object, this is. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can basically play with order. You can start with a verb, you know, you can start with a noun, you can start with the subject, you can start with the object. And so I always tell my students that that is not a constraint that actually gave poets the flexibility to, to put words in, in the order that they wanted. And that's what poetry in, in, in its literal sense is. You know, it's actually, you know, sort of making a mosaic of, of words. Sometimes, exactly. Sometimes in the most unexpected ways, you know, to create these beautiful images and, you know, these beautiful, um, you know, meanings. And I think that Arabic is very flexible with that. It's tremendously flexible. And uh, and so it allows it. Now, when, when you do write in whatever, most of the lyrics that I've heard, quite frankly, even sung like by great singers like Um Kulthum and Muhammad Abdul Wahab, you, you, if, if it's in Fusha, I have not heard a mistake. I've heard Muhammad Abdul Wahab slip once. And I can't remember the example. I have to be fair. I have to now dig into my archives to figure out, you know, what, what grammar mistake it was. But really, they don't slip. They, they, they don't, you know, they, they, they basically, you know, uh, keep to it. It's part of the education. And, and in a way, if, if you went through the old schools, be it through the, the church or the mosque, you know, of training you in, into recitation, I think language and grammar was a huge part of that. Um, it, if people play with it, you know, in terms of the colloquial you know, spoken Arabic now, and, you know, we've heard people experiment also with, you know, bringing in French or bringing in English into the, the lyrics. It, it's really working. I mean, it's working for the purpose that they, you know, want to use, you know, those languages for. And, and you know, it's, it's working tremendously in rap. You know, yeah. without any without any any issue or any problem, you can rap in Arabic. You can mix Arabic with with English or French or whatever it is, and it still really works as long as musically you keep that unit of rhythm. It, mm -hmm. It's totally fine. But Tawfiq, um, you mentioned the freedom that poets have in using mm. um, Arabic. However, when we learn Arabic, it's learned. It's taught in a very or in at least how I learned it and how people I know learned yeah, it. It's taught in a very 
rigid manner where um, you have to be, you have to follow the rules very, very closely. And um, even, I mean, you mentioned also the use of different um, languages or, and, and actually the evolution of language um, in, in the Arab world today. But then when you go back to the Fusha, it's still the same. We're still talking about the same kind of Fusha and the same kind of grammar, et cetera, et cetera. Oh. So what do you think about this? And um, is there a way to, to make the Fusha, you know, catch the, catch the, 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 the flow, if I can say? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit schizophrenic, you know, we have a linguistic situation that's very different, you know, between these two varieties, but, and I don't see them as distinct, I see them as, as, as a continuum, it's basically your, your derja or ammiya is basically part of a continuum that goes all the way to Fusha at its highest, you know, registers, and then at its lowest in, in whatever we use and in our daily life and market. But highest and lowest for me is not a judgment. The problem is with the old teachers, it was a judgment. You know, this is the higher variety, you know, and its and its name is, is tells you about that. It's a nahaw. It's like the way it should be, the way you should walk. This is the path. There's no other path. And, you know, it, it also comes from a whole culture that approached education in a very different way. You know, I think it works with certain things. Like, I, I don't know, now that I'm growing up and outside of school, I look back and I go, oh my God, at age seven, I had to recite Antara bin Shaddad, you know, in front of the class. I mean, that's a horrible thing. It's, it's like asking a child to play, I don't know, uh, Bella Bartok, you know, uh, some sweet, very complicated thing at an age where they don't really understand, you know, what it is that they're doing. But but somehow the, the problem is we've fallen into an education system that was so rigid and all about rote. It's all about memorizing and memorizing. And, 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 and there's a place for memorization. But I think there's a place for, for other things too. And I think grammar can be funny, but they couldn't make it fun for us. You know, nor was, quite frankly, most of the stuff we were taught was not fun. You know, math was the same thing. You know, uh, you, you know uh, we had like whole lessons in, in copying. Uh, you know, when it was so rigid, no, oh, you have to write the noon this way, not that other way. So it... It was a culture that was conforming, you know, most of the time. But I think it can be it can be totally fun. I mean, what I tried to do, I've seen some stuff that's out that that's presented in a, in a very different way, you know, very graphic, you know, with pictures and all sorts of stuff. I've even found al fusha grammar explained in, in Egyptian Arabic. <laughs> You know, which you know is really interesting if you if you watch it. Um, but I think I think that basically this is our dilemma. You know, in, in in terms of our language, is 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 having these two two ends of of a spectrum that seem to be pulling us. You know, in in, in both directions. But we have a huge heritage in in that fusha too. You know that somehow we have to reckon with. You know we have to read yeah. it, we have to deal with it. You know we can't, but we have to think of both as as equal. You know, and as part of this continuum that I'm talking about. Then, in fact, there's beautiful poetry and art that's done in Amiya and and Derja as well, and it's actually of very very high quality. So, let me ask you a, a little like a pedagogical question because mm -hmm. you just talked about this like experience. You know, when you were seven years old, right? You you had to learn this this verse, yeah, you know, right. Um, I, I study jazz piano, and yeah. every every musician who studies jazz gets told learn this Coltrane ver, learn this Coltrane solo, learn this Miles Davis solo. Just there's no way there's no way around it. You need <laughs> to get it in your fingers. Yeah. Um, do you subscribe to that idea? going forward is that has that idea been missing in today's um in the curricula that exists that teach arabic um that idea of just learn it 
learn it, you'll figure out why later. Get it in your and get it into your mouth. It might work with kids, you know, at a certain point, but then when we yeah. look back as adults, you know, we think of it very differently. How, how can you do a Coltrane solo? <laughs> I mean, how how can you just play a Coltrane so it's yeah. like next to impossible, you know, yeah. in a way. But I think I I I think if if somehow that grammar all of a sudden is really put in a in, in a context that is really meaningful, then then it's really amazing. Like the the best lessons that I've had in grammar were about taking a poem. Or taking, you know, uh, a chapter from the Quran or part of it, you know, and, and kind of dissecting it and having a discussion or a debate about why is this so and why is that so and why is the word are the in that way. But you still do not lose how grammar is is really playing an important role in the aesthetics of of the whole poem and and in meaning and in. That in, that in fact, it's, it's it's sort of the DNA of a whole language and its complexity should be celebrated, you know, as opposed to becoming sort of a nightmare, you know, for kids. But the truth of the matter is like, it, 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 people don't do that, you know, most of the teaching that we have and still have, unfortunately, you know, does it, does it, it you know, your teachers don't come with these very creative ideas of how I'm going to teach you, you know, al-Mubtada uh, al-Khabar, you know, today. They, they really don't, you know, they teach it in a very, you know, dry, you know, very strict way that, that you know, makes the children disinterested. However, if you, if you, if, if you do the, did it through a song, for example, in a manner that is really simple and very clear, I, I think it can be enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's actually take this as a, a, a moment to sort of transition into, into music a little more. Um, mm. Part of your scholarship focuses on different musical styles. Um, um, a, as a scholar, you know, how, you know, what was the first, uh, was it, did you start studying music because you were a player and you just started getting into dissecting the music that you or is there like a broader uh, goal, a broader mission? I think I think it started that way. Um, you know, it's it's it, it sort of a it, you know kind of looking the passion to to the intellectual part, which I think is very important for me. Um, you know, it's it's not a dry thing. You know, for me, there's there are other pleasures and so many other effects, you know, that I get actually from doing the research that I do, even though some of it, you know, might not be useful for whatever I'm writing. I'm, I'm learning a great deal about it. But really, if I take a step back from music, I, I think music for me is is kind of an excuse. It's It's my gateway because it's what I know, you know, but but the truth of the matter is like, the, some of the questions that I'm really asking could be asked, you know, through through history or through any other art. It could be. I, I think architecture is very close to what I'm what I'm doing. Uh, uh, painting, uh, generally cultural production of any sort, and and literature as well would fit, you know, within that. I, I chose this path because it's close to me, it's close to my heart, but it's really also what I know, you know, and I think it, if I go back to your earlier question about teaching grammar, it's, it's, I found that if, if I just wrote about linguistics to, to, to this small circle of people using the jargon that they use, it's going to be really dry and it's not going to necessarily address the questions that I want to address. And so music is, 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 is sort of the pathway for, for bigger questions that I'm asking, but I'm asking them through, like I said, what I know best. Yeah. What are, what are the bigger questions? Well, the big questions are, is, are there are so many. It's, it's like I'm, I'm thinking about environment, our environment now. I'm thinking about violence. I want to understand violence. 
and and why it happens and why it occurs. Uh, I I want to understand the way for for us specifically in the region to kind of reckon with our past, mm-hmm. um, you know, address it in a very serious way. Uh, my biggest question is, I, I think it sort of touches a little bit on on your, uh, you, you know, your mission too yeah. in Afikra, which is how to disentangle, you, you know, knowledge from ideology. Basically, this is this is my main. This is my main. This is my main question. How can I actually look at what's being done right now? And, and do that. Also, I'm asking the, the ethical questions. You know, how do I bring a certain number of ethics into, into my work? Like back into thinking and into sorting through problems because I, 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 I don't think it's just an intellectual, rational exercise. I mean, the, the, the fruits of that we can see already. It's, yeah. They're disastrous, you know, in so many ways. And so like everybody, I'm kind of looking at, at this past, trying to understand the missteps and, and what is it that was taken out, you know, from, from this, this, this uh, business of, of thinking, you know, and business of, of studying that, that would actually make me feel a little bit uh, whole, you know. Uh, so, so those ethical questions have, have to be brought in. I mean, yeah. is the, we have no choice. And this is, it's not a religious discussion. For it sure. really isn't. It, yeah. It's way beyond that. I think it's something that is extremely important to all of us. And if you think with me, I mean, it's, uh, these, are not, uh, these are serious times. You know, it's, it's yeah. uh, you know, what's happening to the planet, what's happening to us, what's happening to the way we're living, the way we're relating or not relating to each other, and the identity politics, the nation sure. state. <laughs> you know, now it's like there's a country called Tunisia that's completely separate from Algeria and separate from Libya. <laughs> you know, even though, like, you know, the neighbors across the border are, are like your cousins or your relatives. It's... Um, yeah. And, and and they're managing us right now. They're making decisions about your health, my health, you know, my daughter's health. Uh, it's, so th- these are the big questions that I'm asking. And I, for me, I, I have to hold something. I cannot just theorize about them. Yeah. You know, and I think music has been pretty much the path for me to to sort of pose these questions, you know, and kind of ask about them a little bit, you know. To, Great. Yeah. Do, you, do you have a question? Um, okay, so as I look through this list of some of the, the, um, the, the sort of questions that you're unpacking, they're very pan-regional, right? We're talking yeah. about yeah, Algerian yeah, yeah. music, Iraqi music, Sufi music. Um, you're taking, I mean, even... It, even listening to you now is sort of pan genre as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so I'm, I'm curious if you were to speak to like an intelligent 15 year old who didn't know anything about this, mm. how would you sort of define, how do you, how do you, what is your own working definition of what Arabic, Arab music looks like? Capital A, capital M. You know, mm. like you're talking about, you know, on this slide, this idea of, a false dichotomy in Arab music, using yeah. that term Arab music. Yeah. Um, how, what is your own working definition for that? Mm. I think it's a it's a much more diverse, yeah. you know, music than than we tend to think. Yeah. You know, a little bit, and it, it it is really related to in so many complex ways to to the way you know Arab states have managed them, managed that music. I'm I'm thinking about the recent, you know, the, the something close to the present time, you sure. know, not, not going beyond, you know, to colonialism and, and prior to that, etc. But really just to think about it right now, it's just like not too long ago, who was played on, on Lebanese TV? Yeah. Who, who would you have access to? And if you went out to the market, who, you know, to buy tapes or buy CDs, who would you find, you know, and why did they make it? You know, what kind of mechanism was there to filter 
you know, through all of these people, you know, those artists that would actually make it to the scene or be in. And I, and I know there's, there's, there are other musics too, right? There are many little circles and places where you can go and hear different things, you know, etc. But unfortunately, in, in the modern era, we're in a mass culture. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the voices that are dominant and that are taking, you know, most of the space. You know, our, our voices that, 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 that the commercial system decided are, you know, are, are you know, worth, worth pursuing, et cetera, et cetera. And, and there's some good music in there as well. So basically, I would tell that 15-year-old is like, look, this music is really played. It, it seems to have a shared DNA, like across the Arab world. Uh, there's definitely easily a, a certain appreciation that I have for if if I heard what the Asafi or you know if I heard Fayruz whom I grew up with you know listening to you know as much as I can appreciate you know a, a singer you know from from Mauritania you know the the, the what what is important for this 15 year old is really to have that very wild palette that kind of frees them from these little in cultural enclosures that we've created, you know, where we're not listening to other musics, we're not listening to other diverse stuff. Uh, it's becoming also a generational thing. Like, you know, if you're old enough, you don't want to listen to a rap or, you know, you the classics are, and even though the classics themselves were not classics to begin with, I mean, Uncle Thum yeah. was nothing classic. There's nothing classical about Uncle Thum. You know, maybe early on when she was a little girl singing with her father, but the minute, you know, she came to Cairo, there was nothing classical about her. Oh, you man, know, I wish, I wish you had sent that, said that sentence half an hour ago, because I have so many questions for you now. Yeah, yeah, she's not. She's not. You think about it, you know, the recording industry, you know, affected the way she sang. Yeah. All of them wow. have spaces that are completely different. Nobody sang like Um Kulthum before. Not Munir Mahdi, not anybody. You know, these other names were precursors to her, you know, so that she comes in and sings the way she did. But she really sang in a pretty modern air, you yeah. know, and then the radio. We, I was listening to her in, in Tunis as, as a little boy, you know, tuning in to. Listen to Uncle Thum's, yeah. you know, uh, you know, concert. So basically, I would tell this: uh, look, it's not a contest between Arab music and non-Arab music. It's not a contest between Western and Arab music. Yeah. Or you shouldn't do. Arab music has all of these people have experimented with jazz and Arab music. They've experimented with rap. If they're experiment. They're doing all of these. Just listen to to all of this, and also geographically expand yourself, and expand your horizons, and don't live under the pretext of like, oh, I can't understand, you know, when Moroccans sing. I mean, make a little bit of an effort, and you will. <laughs> so it's, it's just you know, it, it doesn't take too long to do that. Okay, great. I, we can keep on talking for quite some time, but I don't want to. Um, I don't want to take stuff uh, time away from the questions in the chat. So let's do our quick uh, Q and A. Um, so, what are you reading, watching, or in your case, maybe listening to right now um, that you'd like to share? It yeah, I have a bad, bad habit of reading more than one book at once. But I went back actually, and I'm reading uh, the Wretched of the Earth. Oh wow! Right now, yeah. I mean, okay. I've read the book more than once, but I decided to go back, you know, it's to a, it. It's a real pick me upper, so why not pick? It? <laughs> Surely. <laughs> okay. Who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Oh my God. Uh, Say that we. The okay. Egyptian composer and singer Said Darwish. I I would I, I don't know forget yeah. about the there's a bonus you know there's the bonus yeah. of you know hashish and all of that <laughs> stuff that's not what I'm thinking of I'm really thinking of an immensely immensely creative guy 
who I think really turned music, Arab music around in so many ways. It, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I turned the quick question into a... a no, a, please. A, this a is what I'm looking for. But Darwish all of a sudden was really singing about the street. He was singing about people. All of a sudden, the themes of the music are completely different. The guy is so creative musically. I mean, I can't get into the details of what he did. He composed everything you can imagine. Plus, you know, for the first time, we know what the composer is. He established the idea of, here's a composer who composes music. This was prior to Muhammad Abdul Wahab or, or, or anyone else. I would love to be in his shoes, mm. you know, for, and in the Skinderia, you know, and in his time. I would love to do that. I also empathize with him. He had a hard life. That's a great answer. Yeah. Okay. What do people most misunderstand about your work or your line of work? They think that when I talk about changes in Arab music or what happened to it, because quite frankly, quite a bit happened to it, you know, under the colonial period or how the state, for example, so many of these states have mismanaged, you know, cultural production, especially music and how they tempered with it and played with it and destroyed its orality. A lot of people think that I'm actually calling for a kind of a return to the past. You know, they, they, the, their immediate question is like, they ask me, they go like, oh my God, but this music is going to get lost. How do we recover it? You know, how do we do the stuff? And that's not really what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to understand in that process, what is it that, that really changed? It's, it's not that easy to go back. You know, it's, it's, it's pure nostalgia actually to go back. Okay. Great. Our last one is, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? Maybe not Darwish. Uh, not say Darwish, no. I'm, uh, I mean, John Coltrane is quite something. <laughs> Underrated <laughs> John Coltrane, yeah. <laughs> I mean, John Coltrane. You know what, what was amazing to me about him and also about Charlie Parker is, is how when they started, they were not good. They, they really were not good musicians in the beginning. Well, train, you know, people, you know, other musicians' reaction to him, he was, he was not that great. And this guy goes and spends days on end, you know, playing his saxophone until his lips bleed, yeah, exactly. you know? Yeah, exactly, until he starts bleeding. So there's that kind of admiration for somebody who dug so deep and, and I'm not talking about the context. It's a horrible context. I mean, put yourself in John Coltrane's and what's happening in the U.S. and racism and all of these things and where you, there's so much tokenism, you know, about black musicians and how, um, you know, they're, they're, they're so, sort of accepted musically, but, but, but they're not accepted otherwise. And here's this guy who just practices himself to, to, to death almost, you know, with so much pain. Just unleash that expression that he has inside. He just didn't have the technique and he needed that technique. And once he had it, he, he didn't sound like anyone else. I mean, he, he that, that sound, his sound is incredibly unique, so. Perfect answer. Okay, so we have, I think we have six uh, questions so far. We're gonna start with Maurice or it might be Tade who's with Maurice as well. So um, uh, take it away. Uh, and thank you, Mikey and Yusuf. I'm here with my dad. We're listening intently uh, to the talk today. Uh, I, have, I have a quick question. So one is, if you were at your favorite Tunisian cafe, who would be the artist, alive or dead, that would be there and that you'd be listening to? And I heard a rumor, Tofik, I don't know if this is true, but I heard a rumor that you can be parachuted into any Arab city and speak the dialect of the locals. I'd just like you to <laughs> confirm whether that's true or not. Uh, it's it, it, it's it's quite true. Not every city, you know, but 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 almost, yeah. Not every city, you know. I have to get a little more training into uh, my Khaliji dialect, you know, a little bit. <laughs> but um, there's this great uh, singer in Tunisia called Saliha. 
I would I would I would listen to Salehan in a Tunisian cafe. She comes from a very um, humble background, and actually, my mother comes from the same little village, you know, from which Saliha came. You know, we all have to remember how difficult it was for women in the Arab world to sing early in twentieth century. It was it's really really hard for them. You know, to to be musicians because in general music was looked at as as kind of a the lower, you know, sort of a immoral, you know, kind of practice. If you know, associated with with the, this is basically what the elite thought most of the time, and so it it made it all of that and and all of this conservatism that was taking place also in the turn of the century, late 19th, early 20th century, as a rea- as a normal reaction, I, people felt threatened, you know, by the European presence, they threatened in their, you know, traditions, they threatened in their religion and their language, etc. So it's normal for people to have that kind of reaction. But it was really hard for women to make it, especially people like uh, Uncle Tom or Saliha, who would come, you know, from the countryside, you know, into the city, and really start singing as women and end up being respected, you know, as, as musicians and as great singers. So, I mean, I, I salute them because they opened the way, you know, for, for so many singers that we have today and we know today that we, I mean, we don't doubt, I mean, we don't think the same way that, that uh, and, and this, this was true of men too, many men, couldn't play because their parents disagreed. They told them music is not is not for good people, good respectable people. Yeah. So it would be Saliha. Tawfiq, if I can follow up on this with, yeah. uh, well, you mentioned Saliha and um, other Tunisian or North African singers, men and women. Uh, but I mean, you mentioned Saliha. It's very important both because of the quality of her songs, but also of her personal history. Um, yeah. But if you go outside of Tunisia or outside of North Africa, very few people would know about Saliha or about these great no. North African singers. While, you know, I mean, you mentioned Dom Kalthoum or Ismahan and others, people know them all over the world and so on. Is it only about marketing and because they were in Egypt where their name can be everywhere or is there something else? And is there a way to make these great singers known um, them and their songs outside of uh, Tunisia and North Africa. Right. I mean, right now that's changing, at least for living artists. You know, everybody knows Lutfi Bushnab. You know, it, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter. I mean, I've heard him actually played in most of the Arab, you know, cities that I've been to, etc. But it's true, you know, when it comes to the past, people do not explore, you know, that that much. They don't know who Saliha is or, you know, what her songs are. I, I Early 20th century and, and even before that, you know, Cairo becomes a very important center. You know, a, a center actually to which many people just went. I mean, if, if you just count how many Lebanese, Syrians, Tunisians, Algerians, etc., you know, went to Cairo to be trained musically or to study or you know, so so that was that part, and and it's also commercial stuff. But overall, I have to say it frankly. It, you know, it seems that Al Mashraq knows less about Al Maghrib. You know, Al Maghrib knows more about Al Mashraq, and this is like a huge discussion. You know, maybe maybe it's 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 also related a little bit to the idea of the cultural origin. You know, of of Arabness or whatever is connected to it culturally. That, that in fact, uh, you, you should look even further a little bit. Maybe, the, I don't think, like the Egyptian curriculum, for example, exposes Egyptian students, you know, to, to, to poets of North Africa. Or, so they might know Abul Qasim al-Shabi because of a poem or two, but they wouldn't be able to do, you know, more than that. Whereas, you know, when I went to school in Tunisia, I read, I read almost everybody in Egyptian literature. I mean, I listened to Um Kuldum, I listened to everybody, I absorbed everybody. So it, it's a very complex thing, and I think it's probably started 
if you ask me, it started way back, you know, when the Umayyads, you know, leave and then there's Baghdad pulling one way and Andalus pulling the other. Yeah. That we started developing this notion of Al-Maghrib and Al-Mashraq as two cultural entities that are a little bit separate, you know, from that. I mean, just some thoughts, yeah, you know. That's Okay, so we have a bunch of questions left and we have eight minutes. Sure, sure. Sure, sure. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do, I'm going to ask everyone to ask them quite quickly, and then I'm going to try to limit your time as much as possible. So the sure. first one comes from Leila, which I will read, which uh, she asks, do you have any recommendations for, uh, uh, how would you recommend a non-Arabic speaker to start their studies? Any books or classes you would recommend in a sentence or two? A, a non-native speaker? Non-native speaker. Besides your YouTube page, which is fantastic. <laughs> no, thanks. Uh, I, I, you know, if there is the opportunity of living in a country and then taking lessons at the same time, I, I would say go for that. That's okay. probably the best combination. Obviously, now is a bad time, but everything we say is if Corona is over. If, but let's talk, you know, normally. But basically, that would be the best setup. Immersion. Ever. You know, you, you, you would have immersion, but also at the same time, you would have a teacher who would explain that immersion and sort of helps, help you, you know, through it. I think it's the best way. Great. The next question from Susie, which I will also read because her microphone is not working, is how do we integrate music and Arabic language into the current educational systems in the Arab world in a way that fosters creativity while anchoring heritage in 30 seconds or less? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I've been, I've been doing this with my daughter because I'm teaching her Arabic. It's I, I mean you know in New yeah. York and also here in Berlin I'm, I'm her main her main source of of the language. You know basically what we've been doing songs. I basically I'm doing songs with her and through them she's learning colors and seasons and everything. And then we start composing. You know, yesterday, for example, you know, we were doing the colors and then uh, we did the primary colors and then secondary colors and we added a few colors that were not in the song. And then we started singing them on the melody. Sure, you know, I mean, and this is not new, by the way. I have a colleague who did Portuguese through song, through music. You know, you, you, you can study Arabic through Um Kulthum. There's absolutely no problem with that. Do you have a do you have a, a a Spotify playlist that you can pass over with all these songs that you think are? I good don't ones? have a list, but I can send you I can send you a list that somehow if you oh want my God, to that would, that would, have a link to it or. Great. Oh my God! I but I wouldn't that. know where to begin. You know, like there's so much beautiful music in in the Arab world. It's so much beautiful music, and it's everywhere. By the way, everywhere. It's, it's not concentrated in any place. I don't know. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you for these after, after the call. <laughs> um, Izdihar, I think you have a question. Would you like to unmute yourself? Uh, I wanted to ask you, is there a way that, uh, that Arabic poetry can be taught in a way for everyone right now to be able to write and compose such musical pieces and carry on their culture? Mm. Yeah, that's uh, another unfortunate part. Is the uh, right? I mean, there's less and less poetry. That's really, I don't know. I mean, we had a generation of people who just wanted us to be doctors and, and engineers. And what's the third one? Lawyers. You know, like no poets. I mean, who's, who's you know, even though I think most Arabs secret, secretly want to be poets. Uh, <laughs> For sure. No, no, it's it's a great idea. There's one one student from Colombia wrote to me this email out of the blue, and he said, I think he's a native speaker of Arabic, and he wrote to me and he said, you know, can can we actually have some way or form on online to explain the the muallaka, the great poems, you know, in pre-Islamic Arabia, so that they become sort of un understandable and manageable, you know, for people. It, you know, to 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 understand, you know, as a source of inspiration, et cetera, et cetera. It's such a monumental thing. And I wish that, you know, I wish that there would be more efforts of, of this sort. 
when I went to school, Al-Aruz, which is prosody, was like really part of what we learned. Uh, memorizing poetry was a staple. And, you know, there's nothing better in, in terms of getting into poetry than actually reading good poetry and a lot of it. And there's tons of it. There's absolutely tons of it. And some of it is really put to song, you know, just start with the common things. Start with big names like Mahmoud Darwish and just go from, from there and start exploring. Uh, great. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Aaron. Aaron, do you want to read your question? Hi. Yeah. Um, I am not a native uh, speaker or listener um, of Arabic or Arabic music, but I learned Arabic and Aoud in college. So I'm always looking for perspectives about how to introduce other non-native speakers and listeners. Um, and with that background, my question is, um, what are the, some of the most compelling ways you found to introduce uh, non-native speakers slash listeners of Arabic language slash music uh, to the beauty and richness of uh, the language and the music? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the best part for me has been to to really sing with them, you know, to, to really like teach them song and just uh, and, and the music in its in its parts and and sort of begin there like begin from the do itself you know there's so much you know exoticism and mystery you know that's sort of put around it you know that 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 takes away from 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 it being really accessible it is accessible you know, and so, for example, we have the ensemble in the, at Columbia, I'm leading a music ensemble, and the students are mixed in the ensemble. They, you know, I have students also who have not heard or played Arab music before at all. Then sure, you know, there are tons of issues. In the same way in, in your pronunciation, you're going to have to deal with certain sounds and how to produce them. You need, you need to deal with microtones and play in your notes the the right way and learning, you know, certain rhythms, etc. But I think there's no better access to richness than actually to, to, to sort of to taste the pudding itself. You know what I'm saying? You know, and to be in it. You know, rather than I, I, I kind of get very suspicious of 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 generalizing, you know, about the music or, or and, and when I give lectures about Arab music, I, I usually would like to sort of focus on example, like show everything. And... So we've just come up on the hour. Sorry to the people on the call who didn't get a chance to ask their question. Um, I'd like to thank um, Yusuf and Sereen uh, over at the Columbia Center. Thank you so much for making this happen. Also, I'd like to thank uh, Tariq Shadali, who's also on the call, who helped to organize this, who's on the Africa team. Right. Tufik, thank you so much for uh, taking the time okay. and sharing your perspective. I feel like I could talk to you for another hour. <laughs> so um, <laughs> maybe we can have you back uh, sometime you, in the thank coming you, year. Thank you. thank you, yeah. Thank you very and much for inviting me. That, that was a pleasure. This is a really, really wonderful. Um, please fee fill out the, uh, the brief feedback form that I just put on the chat. I'll repaste it. And we have upcoming events. Uh, we have one on Thursday. We have one, you know, three every single week. You can go to our website. Please check out the Columbia Global Center website for their upcoming events. Uh, there's a lot of really good stuff and there's a lot of opportunities for you to be engaged and contribute to the conversation. So thanks everyone. Be well, stay safe. Mm -hmm.